there's no disgrace in a Division II, Division Three, NAIA. <laughs> Baseball's baseball. If you're great and you want to have pro aspirations, they will find you. They're going to find you more on a field playing than sitting on the bench in, in Division One. Great point. Welcome to Episode 6 of the Backpick Podcast. I'm your host, Brett Thomas. Today's guest is Rob Bruno, head of NorCal Baseball, an elite travel ball program here in Northern California that's been going on for over 30 years. Rob sits down with us, talks about all the things that he's seen change over the last 30 years, what he sees that might help the game in the future, and most importantly, we sit down with some great stories. Hope you guys enjoy it. In the shop today with Rob Bruno, founder of NorCal Baseball, a staple here in Northern California for uh, high school baseball. Started in 1991, is that right? Fall of 91 and spring of 92. Love it. Man. A couple years ago. Been a long time. You've seen a lot change in those 30 years, but I kind of want to start at the beginning. I want to hear a little bit about how this all started. All right. Started, uh, I was involved with uh, San Ramon Valley Pony Colt. Okay. Don John's Chick Walsh. So old names there, and they, they did an amazing amount of great stuff mm-hmm. in, in the Valley for baseball. Started there. And a 14-year-old deal, I, I did a Pony All-Star team. We, we went deep into the All-Stars, did great. Uh, I also coached college, or high school in Pop Warner football. And so I was both doing it both, and I got, was getting tired of the football thing. Love football. Uh, that's my favorite thing, actually, more than baseball, but love baseball. A lot of the guys didn't want to play high school football. They said, hey, I want to keep going. And we said, fine, here's what we need to do. We need to find people to play. At that point, fall baseball was not a big deal. Uh, I, our first two games, and I'll never forget it, the first practice we ever had, This is uh, it was in 91, October, early October. They had the, uh, the firestorm up in the Oakland Hills. That's how I remember it. A couple weeks later, we started. We played October, November, played against uh, the Yuba Sutter Rebels up in Yuba City. That's how far we had to go. Bob Teal, I'll never forget it. He says, Coach, welcome. We're 20 and 0 on the fall. I said, Well, Bob, that's great. We're handing out our uniforms today. And that, that, that's how we started. And we played a doubleheader. And I said, Bob, I'm glad that you're now 20 and 2. We, we, <laughs> we, we had a great crew. Um, one of the guys that was on that, actually, a Cal High guy, Garrett Ray. I don't know if you remember Garrett, but great, great guy. And, and just so happens that his son, Brady, now plays for us also. We've had maybe 15 to 20 uh, second-generation guys now. Crazy. Yeah, and here's, here's the beautiful part. Some of the uh, kids on the, on the first team are now grown men. Cy Simonton. Cy played pro ball, had a, had a nice little minor league career. Unbelievable person. Diallo Fawn. They're both, they're both head coaches uh, in, in our program now, giving back. Uh, it's, it's fantastic. We love doing what we do. So cool. So yeah. cool. You guys, I mean, when I was growing up, obviously even just, you know, 20 years ago, the landscape was crazy different than it is now, but you guys were the best of the best at mm-hmm. that time because there wasn't a lot of the, you know, I, I really actually hate the term travel ball. I don't really even like, like putting programs like yourself in that. We're a college development program. There you go. Uh, college and or pro. I mean, awesome. And at the time, there wasn't, we were all playing Legion. Right. You know, we played Legion, Pony. Um, you know, I even played in my little league until I was 15 years old because that's kind of what you did at mm-hmm. the time. Um, but you guys started with the high school stuff and had just such elite teams. Um, I mean, your guys, you guys had guys getting drafted. I mean, like, like a majority of your teams yeah. getting drafted back then. I would tell you that uh, high school and college kids, last year, we had 11 drafted. Uh, three first round, three second round, and a third round. Eleven overall, fourteen point six million. So we're, we're, we still get a lot of guys drafted. We're fortunate. Talking about travel ball, uh, I want to ban the word travel ball, delete it out of everything. Uh, they should be development programs. Travel ball is a negative connotation. Uh, my definition is little league on wheels. That, that's what travel ball is, and some of the stuff that's going on and. Uh, it, it's, it's insidious. Uh, we're glorifying 13 and 14 year olds, having them commit on live, uh, uh, TV. Uh, it's ridiculous. Uh, it's hurting everything. And we've got to get back to what's right. Baseball is a bunch of great life lessons. And that's what it's all about. 
It's life lessons. You're going to be a person a lot longer than a baseball player. You better do a great job developing off the field and on the field. It's, yeah, absolutely. Some of this stuff is crazy. We're, we're chasing $12 plastic trophies on weekends, chasing rankings. Um, here's my thought on rankings. We're, we're rambling here. That's all right. This is it. This is all what right. we do. This is what we do. Ramble away. All right. My, my thought on rankings is pr- pretty well known. Two rankings that matter. College that signs you to a letter of intent. Pro team that drafts you. Important. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to important on that. All right. College that signs you to a letter of intent. Not commits. There you go. Let's, I, I wanted to make sure we em- emphatic that point there. Should we talk about commits? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about commits. So here's the thing. I think the first thing to say in all of this is that uh, every single person, whether you are working in baseball or anything, you're looking for an edge to be better, Right. And everybody's going to push the envelope on that. Obviously, I think you and I know morality comes into it a little bit, which mm-hmm. which upsets us as those who are working with these you know children. But the reality is, is the rules are the way they are. The system is the way it is. It's really how do you how do you navigate it? And I think that's a thing where someone like yourself, who's been so involved in it so long, helps. How do you navigate that situation of the? young commits when is it time for a kid to commit in your eyes when is it time to hang on i know you have offers but let's wait a little bit or is the even talking to the kid that says i know look you you are a division one player it's not coming right now but it's going to come you and i have had uh, a lot of common kids Mm -hmm. and a couple that are near and dear to us for sure and and it, it it was breaking our hearts for a couple of these kids because we knew these are division one guys now finally they they got their their, their offers, and they, they're now committed. We still have a few more. Uh, it's, we, we're never done until all our kids are done. They're placed one place or another. It's important. Uh, it's a one-sided deal. It's a one-sided deal for the colleges. And one of the things, Brett, that I'll tell you is we don't have any of our kids. When I And I do a lot of, uh, everybody knows me as far as on Twitter, I, I put a lot of our guys up. I never put committed or uncommitted. Um, my feeling is you just keep working. I've got a new T-shirt. I've got to bring you one. It's, you'll, yeah, you'll like it. I do. Uh, yeah. uh, we're looking for OKG, our kind of guys. And my only commitment is to my brothers, my, my teammates. That's all that matters right now. You can't think about that because guess what? The guys, and, and I saw a kid uh, commit yesterday. And he committed to Stanford, and he's a great kid, and he'll stay. But there are so many nationwide that are 7th grade, 8th grade, that are going to SEC schools. Uh, they usually don't pan out. Over a half, closer to three quarters. Don't get there, and if they get there, they're out of there by a year. So for us, it's more important just to keep developing, keep working, find the great fit. The one thing I'm going to tell you is align yourself, if you're a family, if you're a player, with people that actually care about you. Uh, Some people have agendas. They have agendas, and they're going to steer them to schools that they want to steer. I heard a story. I was talking to Prominent Power 5. We were were on their, their deal, and they're talking about a camp that they went to. And they said, well, where's this guy, this guy, this guy, this guy? He says, well, they're SEC guys. Who determines where guys go? <clears throat> now, should we guide them and say, this is a good place for you if they ask us? Yeah, but it's their decision. It's their decision. And by the way, we can't be uh, the, the, the college's uh, best buddies in there. Our, our allegiance is to our players. Simple. And our allegiance to our players has to do with being honest with them, too. Mm-hmm. And I think we always... The stories always come about about our best players, right? Oh, so and so is going right. wherever so and so going. Well, right. Here's the reality. I like to think that I I make an impact on the guys, but the guys that are going to the highest levels, you know, those guys were born with some gifts yeah. that got them to there, mm-hmm. right? There's some guys that I love seeing that have worked to get to those levels, and that's awesome. But it's the ones that see the guys at the highest levels and start to compare themselves, and we got to sit down and have those real conversations and say that's not who you are. And I think that's the problem to me is that not enough people in this industry are willing to legitimately sit down with a family and say, you're not that good, right? There's a place for you, right? But you're not that good. You're good, but here's your level. For sure. Uh, let's talk about uh, the, the backup now in Division One. We saw it with, with, our, with our 2023s. Uh, it was horrible. 22s, it was tough too. Uh, 23s has been worse. Uh, there's going to be a lot of attrition going on at Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA, JCs. Uh, there's too many kits. All, all, the whole COVID thing 
it's really bogged down everybody. Now that's gonna go away in this next year. For 24 is a little bit easier, for 25 is a little bit easier. But how many guys do we know that are we consider quote unquote division one that had to wait a long time, maybe not getting any money just yet? So we've got to help navigate for these guys. Uh, with the portal, we're talking about the portal now. The portal's been crazy. There's enough guys in there to field about like 40, 50 teams, somewhere around there. They're never going to play again. I would rather have our guys sit down and, and come up with a great game plan to find the school that fits them best as people. Uh, we, we don't talk about four-year decisions. We talk about 40-year decisions. Who you are. You went to one of the, the, the number one public school in the, in the world. Number three overall. Best decision you ever made. Those are the things, and yes, that's the Cal, Cal Berkeley, by the way, California Go Bears and all those good things. <laughs> I think we sent 50 guys there, somewhere oh, around there. I believe it. Including the head coach. I think half of my team played for you. Yeah, including yeah. the head coach. Yeah. Yeah. So when, when we talk about something like that, it's crucial that, that we do a great job finding those fits. I, I think now going forward, I think that those fits are going to be even more important. We're going to look for places that develop uh, out of the COVID era. I would tell you that people started taking shortcuts as far as their recruiting part. Coaches, even some pro scouts, but more coaches. Um, we sometimes, there's some great college coaches, obviously. We've, we're good friends with a lot of them. But sometimes we give them too much credit for knowing talent. And then what are they going from? Uh, is it just video? Is it just numbers? Because numbers don't play on a field. A uh, guy might have a 98 exit and he does it twice out of 10. What's he doing the other eight times? Mm -hmm. Those are the things that you can't measure. You can't measure uh, brains, can't measure heart, that kind of stuff. It, it's, it's important. I'll, I'll give you a little funny story. So Dusty Baker, I'm thrilled for Dusty. And uh, he's a friend and I coach his sons. And Melissa, his wife is great. And, and Melissa gave me a great quote. You'll love this. He says, well, we're looking for guys that have nuts and guts. And I'm thinking, <laughs> Melissa, that's great. You, I, I said, you got that from Dusty. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And, and those things you cannot quantify in numbers. Can't do it. And a lot of those guys that, that have the nuts and the guts and maybe not the numbers, mm -hmm. um, most of the time are, are going to be able to produce at the next level. Yep. Right? And I think some of those guys were trying to get to understand, hey, you're a competitive guy. Um, you know, I'll bring up a guy that, that we talk about together a lot, Trevor Harmon at, at oh. Foothill, right? And and here's the thing. Here's the, here's the common denominator about Trevor, right? You know, everything he does is solid. He's, he's a fantastic defender. But the minute he started catching on the varsity team at Foothill, they became very good. Yep. And I don't think that that's a, you know, there's not, there's a correlation there, right? Last year they had two guys pitching that were talented, but a little unproven, all of a sudden, they, they became guys, right? And I think that's the type of guy that's going to help a program win. So it gets to the point, and I'm, I'm happy he's finally got a home. We're, we're excited for him. But some of those types of players, sometimes I'm like, let's go find a really good D2 because here's the thing. You want to go win. Right. And a lot of times, you know, there's, there's you know, 100 and something D1 programs you know, or whatever it is, how many? Right. There's 300 something or whatever. I was yeah. thinking football's only got 100 yeah. something, but uh, but the idea being that you just want to say you play D1 and you're going to go win 10 games a year, right? And the reality is like, dude, you get to go play in the playoffs. You get a chance to go play for a World Series. I think my experience at Cal unbelievable because I played with some great players. I, I met the you know the greatest people in my life that are part of my circle now. Mm -hmm. But when I played a college summer baseball. And it was like we were competing at a high level and you're playing every day and, you know, academics are important. But excuse me, where I don't have to worry about school and I can go play and not yep. think about Just it. Just get after it. Dude, those times are the times that come up to my memories more than the actual school college baseball itself. Yep. Because we're competing at a high level instead of just like, are we going to get into a regional? I don't know. You're not playing as many of those like meaningful playoff impactful right. games. And I think more guys that have that nuts and guts should be trying to find fits where they're going to be able to use their nuts and guts on a high level. I remember a, a guy that we always have, you know, we've had 64, I think, big leaders, somewhere around there. And we only count guys that are full-time. You talk about like Josh Satin, we were talking about Josh earlier. Josh played, you know, a little bit for us. Alan Craig, same thing. Great guys. They played about three or four terms. Can't count them. Uh, but, you know, they're, they're honorary, so to speak. J.J. Hardy is one of them. Uh, so we've had some unbelievable guys, but the, you know, that, that being said, uh, 
you've got to find guys like I, I'll, a great example, a guy that made the big leagues. Um, I thought, how in the world did he do it? It was Casey McGee. Casey McGee had a he had a great great career. Mm-hmm. Uh, first time he ever was with us, we were at San Ramon Valley High School, and he was a little bit a little bit nervous. And he rolled over three. He says, "Hey, coach, can you take the swing and bunt sign off?" You know, but he was that guy. But he, if you watch Casey, and he, he wasn't some six foot two, two hundred and ten pound guy. You know, six feet tall, one seventy, and couldn't run. But that guy was incredible with RBIs. He was incredible. We put him on the mound, 86, 87, with a good slide piece. He could beat anybody at that level. So those are the guys that are, are incredible. How many guys do you know in the minor leagues or guys that played in college that were incredible specimens? You're thinking, all right, this, this, this guy is 97 with, with movement. This guy hits the ball 420 feet. Can't play. Mm-hmm. Can't play. Yep. So I think we're doing a disservice for a lot of those guys because we're, we're not doing a great job watching. And, and I think from the COVID time, talking about getting back to that, relying too much on video, relying too much on numbers. And I think we, we've got to watch a guy. And I, I was talking to a kid the other day and talking to his dad. You're the kind of player that if they watch you four or five games in a row, oh boy, you're, you, they know that you're going to help. They watch you once, they can't see everything you do. Do coaches do that anymore? The I don't best, mean to be like cynical on the this. The best ones do. I was going to say, because like, mm-hmm. there's just too much of the, the numbers, the showcase, the thing. It's like, are there coaches out there following guys saying, I, I think I, I see a little something here, but I'm going to need to see more? Or is it like, no, I only saw 84 on the gun, so I'm out? Or I, you know, I saw him not a whole lot off the bat, so I'm out? So I would, I would tell you that the best ones, uh, especially if we communicate, say, you know, this is a guy, they'll sit on a guy four games in a row. When they sit on a guy, and that's why I'm not a big – and we have, we have our World Series, but that's like game situations. Um, if, if we're just – taking in and outs and taking our BP and running our 60s, and then we're taking five crow hops from shortstop to get our, our best velocity across, which makes no sense. It, it doesn't make any sense. You, you, you sit on a guy for four games, five games, you know what he can do. Mm-hmm. You watch and you, you record a guy throwing 60 pitches, not, not just as high, not just his best, you know, his best off speed. Watch him compete when you got guys on. Now you can tell the guy – uh, good pro scouts do that. For sure. College coaches, they got lazy with it, and I think they're getting back to it. The older guys, they get it. The younger guys, they're in a different era, and they they need to really buckle down more, I think, and sit on guys. And I don't want to say they're lazy. They just don't know. Well, and, and you know, there's a lack of staff, right? I mean, there's no doubt that I think mm-hmm. everything that we've talked about here today, we could probably all blame on the NCAA. There's a lot of lazy people, I think, in the NCAA in terms of what's going on. No teeth in the NCAA. Yeah. They, they can't do anything anymore. For sure. So now you have the ability to pay more coaches, right? It just came out. June. That you can pay more coaches. So with that being said, when you look at like what football's done, and obviously, again, you can pay more coaches, but you you know the NCAA is not giving you any money. Right. They're just giving you the ability to pay more coaches. Mm-hmm. So it's probably going to benefit more of, obviously, the big-time Power 5 schools. But are those schools going to now, do you think, just have a guy that is essentially a scout and a recruiter and whatever they do in practice on the field, if they can contribute, fine. But get them on the road and get them seeing people more on a regular basis, doing a little deeper dive, sitting down with families and really like like a pro scout, figuring out if this guy's an actual fit for the program instead of just the, oh, I saw him pop 94 off the bump, let's let's get a contract in front of him. To a certain extent, they do already. Okay. Uh, the, the third guy, the fourth guy, they're, they're back home working like practices and things. That's when later on in the spring, later on, they'll be out there uh, hustling when, and missing a couple practices. Early they don't. They don't miss any. They don't have the wherewithal for weekend stuff, right? They just don't. I mean, they're coaching. So the coverage just isn't there. Summertime, it's interesting. They're, they're kind of consolidating times now where they give uh, Father's Day off. You know, there's about a four-day dead period. Uh, they're giving Fourth of July off, three or four-day dead period. So people have to work around that. They're cutting uh, late August until about right around my birthday, around the 10th of September. They're cutting those times also. So they're consolidating when you can see. So it's making it a little bit easier. That's why you have to, as, a, as, a, as an organization, uh, Tony and I have to really pick and choose to make sure. Uh, the one thing I'm going to tell you is we don't always go to something because it's a great recruiting opportunity for exposure 
We also go because it's iron sharpening iron. We want to face great teams. Uh, not enough of that is happening now. Uh, when when we started in its whole inception, we just let it fly. We wanted to find out who the best guys were. Uh, we go to a national tournament to win it, number one. Uh, we want to teach these guys how to develop and how to win because there's an art to winning. If the scoreboard's on, we're trying to win. But also to sharp, you know, iron versus iron. A, a pitcher or a catcher or a shortstop can say, you know what, I'm good. That shortstop from Florida, that guy's money. I got to go beat him out. So we, it was a matching thing. It's how, how do we stack up? Always gave us the impetus to work even harder. Well, and, you know, there have been really good teams in this area mm-hmm. for a long time. Yeah. And the fact that, that a lot of them don't play each other right here yep. in the backyard is crazy. And I think that was one thing I thought you and Don always were yep. phenomenal at, right? I mean, Don always had the goal of, hey, we're going to go try to win the Connie Mac World Series. But in the middle of that, on Tuesday right. at San Ramon Valley High School, we're going to play NorCal. Right. And and you now created this like kind of midweek game that a lot of times is lazy and everyone's kind of just going through the motions to go, nah, man, like – these are like the two best programs around. We got to yeah. show the who's boss around here. Oh, and it uh, creates that competitive level that you guys and, always And guess try. what? There are six schools watching. For sure. Yeah. Uh, I would tell you we're doing more of that. I, I'm not a fan of local tournaments. I think they're garbage. Uh, I don't want to play Sunday morning at 8 and be there at 7 when we just played a Saturday night. I'd rather control our own destiny. Tony and I are putting together more stuff. That makes a lot more sense. Uh, regular during the day, mm-hmm. uh, we're reaching out to other other, other groups now, uh, to EJ, to to Zoop, all those guys, uh, to to the Admirals, uh, great guys, Dyron Rowling and, and some of those guys, even Lance Franks up in Chico. We're doing more local stuff, home and homes. Uh, I think it makes more sense, and we have the ability also between all of us. And you know, we've done this for a little while, so we've got a little bit of credibility with college coaches. I can bring in ten guys on a Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And it's silly to, to go play some stupid tournament on a weekend where the only people that are making money are the directors of the tournaments. Mm-hmm. Makes no sense to me. Even mm-hmm. some of the national stuff, we're going to go to two or three things, but we're going specifically because it's going to be a great competition. We're going to go to the Music City uh, tournament in, in Nashville. Not, not a bad place to go. That's but on top of that, what we'll do is we'll go to University of Tennessee. We'll go to... Uh, uh, to Clemson, where Eric Backish is out there, a local guy, played for me. Awesome. Uh, so that's special. Uh, we'll also uh, go to Nashville, uh, to, to Vandy also. So Tim's a good friend. So our guys last year did something amazing, and that's kind of why we're doing this. We took a bus trip, a little college development program type bus trip. We uh, flew in on July 14. And I'll never forget this. It was just an amazing experience. July 15, we're at University of Texas. Here we are in Austin. The whole staff worked with our guys for six to eight hours. Um, well, one of the staff guys was uh, was Tulo. So Troy was there, gave one of the best speeches ever. He will make a great skipper in the big leagues or a head coach in college. Dynamic guy. Yeah. Uh, Peter Hansen was there. Peter was taken two or three days later, uh, third round to St. Louis. Uh, Steve Singleton I got to see. You remember Steve? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So Steve, he got up to AAA. Great player. He's now the recruiting coordinator or the associate head coach for softball at Texas. Next day, we go down to a little place called TCU. Not a bad place. The following day, we go to LSU. Get, get to see our, our, our boy Nick Bronzini, awesome. who has spent years and years right here at the shop. Yep. Uh, this, is, uh, this is his second home. Yep. Uh, and then Nick and I and, and the rest of our team get to go to a, a great sports bar on the 17th where we see... Some of his best friends and some of my favorite kids drafted that night. What an experience. So cool. Then we go down to Lake. So they, 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 when you go to those things, and I think more teams should do that, you go to those things, you feel like, okay, I can see myself doing this. I've got something to shoot for. And those things are important. That's why I think college camps are important. But you, you, can't, you can go blind and broke and everything else. Go to those. So you find the ones, the two or three top ones that fit. What does that do? That gets you into that camp to where you can get a feel for the college coaches. You can go talk to some of the guys that are there. But every bit is important. Those coaches can get to see you as a person. Absolutely. So you got to find the right ones, too. You don't, you don't want the cattle call that helps uh, the volunteer coach and the ops guy. You want the all-star one. And from that all-star one, it's also the cheapest because they want you there. Mm-hmm. 
No, absolutely. So I'll um, backtrack back to the local yeah. thing. You know, I think this would be awesome. I don't know who it benefits and who it doesn't. Again, I'm I'm strictly on the development side, so yeah. I'm pretty impartial to everything. Right. Obviously, I have you know programs that I prefer guys play to yeah. and, and not. Um, but it's the idea that what if could there be a you know I guess you'd have to have some sort of a you know neutral party kind of governing something. But like a again, there's so many good teams here. Can we yeah. just put a league together that's highly competitive and give guys a you know because again, there's just in my opinion, you know, when when we were kids growing up, we played in the summer. Yep. We played freaking five or six times a week. Oh, yeah. You know what I mean? And now it's like everybody's like, oh, yeah, I have a tournament like every other weekend and like whatever. And it's like, well, that's fine. Those tournaments are important. But like the other times, you should be playing games and you should have – it's like everybody could have a home field out here. Yep. You could run – you know, even if you started with like the six better programs around here and just say, hey, here's how it's going to work. Don't let it be too secondary – where you're not going to like throw your best guys or anything like that because you want it to be thing, but then create a super cool tournament at the end of the summer that guys have something to shoot for instead of just shooting for these little one-off, I'm trying to win this tournament and that tournament, you get a little bit of that longer goal. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Exactly. It'll be a perfect time. We're, we're starting to do some home and homes already. And so I think it's going to, whether it's this summer, and it could be because we're talking about it, mm-hmm. to different guys. Uh, again, I've got about a three years left of this stuff and, and I want to help create that legacy. Um, you know, and I've talked to Aaron about this too and some different things and Aaron McNeil is phenomenal here and uh, all, all everybody here is great. And so that m- makes it a lot easier for me to come in. And so anyway, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we're going to do some Islander stuff. We're going to do some different things. So the answer is yeah. And you know, Tony, Tony's the, the brains of our deal. Tony Cravello is unbelievable. He's my, he's the left brain guy came in in 95. He's been doing this since he was like, 12, I say, not really, but 21. Mm-hmm. I'm the right brain guy. And everybody kind of knows, you know, I'm, I'm the mouthpiece, so to speak, but he's the brains and it's been great. He stirs the ship. And that's kind of what we talk about. Uh, but yeah, so he he's organized a couple of really great things. And unfortunately, they're out in Stockton more because there's more fields. For sure, for sure. Uh, that, that's the challenge we've got, but that's not overcomable. We go to Islander, we go to Delta, uh, UOP, uh, some really good schools out there. I wish we could do more here. Um, I would tell you this, if the high schools, and I'll tell you the community colleges, and I love some of them. Mike Curran's a good friend. Uh, he does a great job at, at, at Ohlone and uh, a lot of different places. They are cost prohibitive. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I wish we had uh, four or five fields right together where we can do a lot of this stuff. In the Bay Area, we're landlocked a little bit, yep. and it costs so much that right now, unless I hit that lottery, which it, when I do, I'm going to build an incredible complex. Can't we're wait. stuck. We're stuck. Yep. But we're, we're doing what we can. Getting back to some of the roots, we're going to have those games. Uh, working on uh, some tournament stuff. In the spring, uh, we just took a, t- a 12-year-old team up in El Dorado Hills. And we're having them connect with four or five different groups. More home and home doubleheaders. Uh, they're doing that. Uh, our junior highs guys, we, we've got something we call the Elite League. Four weekends or five weekends or so out at Islander Field. Neat complex. Talk about Don Johns. Don runs that. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, I've known Don for 35 plus years, which is kind of crazy. We made probably the most volatile dugout of all time. He and I were in the same dugout coaching together. No, too oh, much. Oh, my goodness. Too much. Oh, it's incredible. <laughs> Don is one of my favorite people in life. Uh, always has been, always will be. He's an amazing guy, mm-hmm. given, given his life to... A lot of this stuff, just like a lot of us, for sure. But uh, so, what well, the the whole idea there is development. Uh, we don't we don't have uh, we we put away rap sodos. We, we'll raid, we'll gun them once in a while. It's not about numbers. It's about development. Uh, that's what you do here. It's what I love. Why you're doing stuff here with 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 everything you do. These kids are getting better. It's a day by day process, mm-hmm. and it's a journey. Uh, how I've seen some of these kids grow, it, it's incredible. A lot of the work's done right here, and I think that's another piece of the the travel ball or the what do we what did we call it? Uh, college, college development, development CDP College Development Program. There you go. So I think that's another struggle with some of the programs where it's the idea that you know we're in a world of and I always take this off of I think we all know that professional baseball is the mecca in terms of developing players. Right. right? They they literally spend all their time figuring out how to develop each individual guy yep. and they get to a point where it's like you know here's the plan here's what we have to do 
they have all the resources. Yep. Unfortunately, like a lot of the, the programs around here don't have the resources, don't have the fields, maybe the coaches, maybe don't have the time because right. everybody's kind of spread out. You can't get everybody together. So it becomes the idea of you kind of got to be good at what you're good at and just allow that to be that. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've always, you know, everyone's always like, when are you guys going to start teams? Never. Like this is yeah. not, that's not our thing. We, we want to be in skill development, right? That's your niche. But there's too many teams that are trying to do all and they don't have a lot of guys or time to be able to actually put a plan yeah. together for guys to develop. You guys have always been great in terms of that kind of cohesion with, you know, the mm -hmm. development side and what we're doing. What do you say to those those kids that are kind of in the middle of that where they're like, my you know, coach on my travel team is telling me X, but my hitting coach is telling me X, right? That it's a difficult thing because they deep down know their hitting coach is more qualified right. probably to tell them what right. to do, but they also don't want to kind of they want to be able to play or not feel like they're shunning their coach. Ego gets in the way, unfortunately. With, with us, what we do is this. Uh, Tony and I tell these kids, hey, you got somebody good that you're working with? That's great. Whether it's hitting guy or pitching guy, we think that's fantastic. As a matter of fact, give me the two or three things that you're working on so we can reinforce what you're doing. It should never be ego. I, I see the you know high school coaches get offended sometimes. Well, you're not, you know you're only going to work with us. Well, guess what? He's working with somebody really good. I mean, who's who's going to teach catching better than you at some high school? Not going to happen. Well, and there's results, right? I mean, if yeah. if if they're struggling, uh, hey, we got to do something different. Right. And he might be right in that sense right. that we need to change some things, right? Mm -hmm. My problem is guys are not struggling. And then it's like, oh, we got to do it this way or that way or, or right. the other. And it's the idea of we're all in the same boat here. I'm working to help get the kid results, which in turn gets you results. Right. So I think the other piece that bothers me is, you know, my phone, I answer it, yeah. right? And it's very, like, I just think that there's been a, a, some great high school coaches that have walked in here and said, hey, I just kind of want to get on the same page. Perfect. You know, this is what we're doing, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah. Um, and there's some that say you know hey once the season starts don't go there we're on our own we're on our own deal and that's too bad uh i think high school summer development uh private instruction uh they all should complement each other and be on the same page uh does ego get in the way sure i've got a big ego you've got a big ego mm -hmm. that's what makes us special uh but when arrogance overtakes intelligence that's the problem. Uh, we've got to look out for what's best for our guys. Uh, again, it's about our guys. It's not about anything else. Um, it's not about our win-loss. Uh, it's not about that type of thing. It's not about where we send guys, anything else. It's about how our guys are developing on and off the field. And if we all complement each other, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So one last piece on the on the kind of the travel ball, yeah. I guess, gripes that I have. Yeah. Um, talk about managing pitchers and managing arms in general. So mm -hmm. here's another one of my gripes on the whole, you know, kind of landscape right now. Again, I, and again, I, I think we, we should be modeling everything we do off of what professional baseball does sure. to develop players. And they play spring and summer. Yep. In the fall. Shut down. Shut down. And they ramp up for the season, right? Yep. Now, with high school season starting even earlier, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they're starting in February, and there's like that ramp up. There's no time within this if you have spring, summer, fall, and then you're going, you know, getting ramped up for the first yep. week of February. There's no time to really shut down or, or figure it out there how is. to ramp it up. There is. I'll tell you what we do. Uh -huh. uh, first of all, uh, what we do, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll credit Tony a lot for this one. We count uh, innings. And, and we got this a little bit from Alan Jager. Alan's been a good friend for 30 years. He's one of the, the biggest inspirations for us, what he does. Uh, shutting down, he's got a great book about it. So what he does is, and what we do is, we count total innings for in 12 months. That's a big deal. Uh, a lot of it's right around 80 for our guys. Mm -hmm. If they throw a whole bunch, guess what? We're going to shut them down for a couple weeks during the summer. Uh, we have a season where we go June, July, about seven weeks hard. We take August off pretty much. Uh, and we, you know, you can, you can get after it playing regular catch, flat ground, that kind of thing. You know, active, active rest is what we call it. Mm -hmm. And then in September, October 
It's only about a six more week deal. We don't go all the way through. And it's a modified deal. You're throwing once a week and it might be 50, 60 pitches total. Mm -hmm. That's it. Uh, and, and then we don't even probably third week of October, we're done. Yeah. We might have some clinics in November. Guess what? That's not guys pitching off the mound. What we also do though, is we, we just, uh, as I told you earlier off, off, uh, camera, we have a great thing that we do in, uh, in MLK weekend. We just had a great three or four days down in Arizona, uh, Tempe and then down to Tucson. That being said, all of our guys have been shut down for a long time. And then now they're ramping up. reason why we do it now, a lot of schools are just going to be starting this next week or two. We want to give our guys a little bit of a jump start. Mm -hmm. Nobody threw more than 45 pitches in Arizona. Not one guy. Uh, I credit Dan Bugarin for that. Dan's been with us for years. And, uh, you know, that's how we do it. Cy Simonton, same thing. So we have a pitch count there. But we also have an inning count for the whole year, the whole 12 months. Uh, these guys get pulled so incredibly. If you're really good... And Southern California is the worst. Uh, you, you've got your, your summer uh, development programs. You've got your scout teams. You've got your high schools. They're getting pulled three directions a lot of time in the wall. Well, somebody's got to manage that. And it's got to be the, the parent, and it's got to be the player. They've got to have their own best interests. Uh, I see too much of that. I also see guys that are young throwing two days in a row, three days in a row, and they're catching. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? I know. It's crazy. So we have to start managing that. One of the reasons why we went down to some junior high stuff is to help educate. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody's got to care and somebody's got to educate. Uh, they are indoctrinated to some weird stuff. For sure. Uh, so it, it's about education. It's about long-term process. Uh, it's the journey. It's not the end results. Uh, even the pitch smart stuff is garbage. Uh, I don't think a guy should throw when they're 12 years old, 13 years old. Back to back days. I literally was going to say that exact same to you. I said, Never. "There's, there's no, there's no minimum. No, it's no like, oh, if you, if you get to only thirty pitches, no, no, just stop. Like they shouldn't throw because here's the thing: you're throwing them at freaking shortstop right. when he's not there. Yeah, do you know what I mean? So or it's catcher. like it's even worse. Yeah, so it's like, what are we doing here? There's no, there's no need for a guy to throw back to back days, yeah. right? And again, there's a time and a place. Mm -hmm. This is why the the landscape of just going weekend to weekend kills you. Yeah, if you're playing a full season. You have a 40-game season that culminates with playoffs. Yeah. Well, now you've ramped your pitcher up. Right. And when you get to the playoffs, if you feel that that guy, the big physical guy, right. can throw on back-to-back -back days or the guy can come back on short rest, you know that guy. But for you to just, on the first weekend of the year, you're going out there and you're like, oh, yeah, Billy's going to go Friday, Saturday, and Sunday yeah. pitch for us for the last inning of every right. game, that's absolutely not acceptable. It's not, and we just need to keep educating because that's, that's the biggest thing. Uh, and, and parents, they have egos too. They want to see Johnny pitch. Mm -hmm. And Johnny never going to say no. He's sure. just going to say, sure, I can do it. Or he and, wants to do it. Uh, he wants to do it. He should want to do it. And, and Johnny's not eating anything that day. And his energy level sucks. And he's going to compensate. And there's going to be injuries. And For sure. those are all the things that, that lead up to that. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So we've had fun talking about all that kind of. I guess bullshit really yeah. of all that. I want to hear some stories. You've got some obviously great players that have played for you. Give me some stories of some of these guys back in the in the earlier days. You know, a lot of these guys know that are in the big leagues or have you I mean crap, you got so many guys that have had long big league careers yeah. and retired already. Okay, so when you have guys retire and they're on the list for the Hall of Fame for votes, you you know you've done it once or twice. Pretty cool. Yeah, you know, guys like Jimmy uh Troy's gonna be coming up. Pat Burrell, what a story he is. Pat's nuts. Mm -hmm. So Pat was giving a, 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 this guy a little bit of a bad time, not in a bad way, but we were down in Orange County. We we're, we're at this Woodfin Suites. And I said, Todd, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get him. So I, I call up Pat and said, hey, meeting in our room. So he, he opens up the door. Todd throws this whole big thing of ice water all over him. Pat looks down and says, no meeting, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but Pat just said, nah. Whatever. He, he loved it. Shrugged it off. Yeah. Um, and there's guys like Jimmy. When Jimmy was 14, uh, we had Jimmy there and Xavier Nady, uh, uh, JD, Jason Dennis. Oh, that boy could pitch. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. And so those are some guys that you know real well. Oh, yeah. So uh, I'll never forget. Uh, uh, it was 94, and we had Bobby Hill he playing the big leagues. Uh, Justin Gamal playing third base, got to AAA, and he was involved in, in pro ball for 15 years. So 
he, we're over there. Jimmy's over there. He's talking to three or four guys. And I think, hey, come on, guys. Let's go. Stop messing around. Oh, Jimmy's teaching us primaries and secondaries. Um, <laughs> smartest guy I've ever met That's in my Jimmy life. That's Jimmy Rollins, Jimmy by the Rollins, way. Jimmy yeah. Rollins, yeah. yeah. Smartest guy I've ever met in my life. Uh, he is too smart to manage a team. He should be the president of a team. Uh, he could run a Fortune 500 company. Uh, we've had some amazing people. We've had pretty good shortstop, second baseman. Uh, Troy to the whiskey does not suck. Uh, Dustin Pedroia was pretty good. Yep, he plays uh, okay. Yeah, and how about Brandon Crawford? How was that? Yeah. yeah, yeah, we were we were smart. Uh, some of my best jobs were like, good job, boys. Xavier mm-hmm. Nady hitting. Uh, that that boy could hit a fastball. Yes. Yeah. You know, then we got crazy kids like like Jock Peterson. Uh, great example of a youth baseball to get into high school. Everything else. Jock was better. He was the best wide receiver at. At uh, Palo Alto. Do you know the other guy that was behind him? Devontae Adams. Devontae Adams. Yeah, crazy. Behind him. I know. So Stu, great friend. Stu is dad. He's a classic. He's coaching our eighth grade team. Do you know Cody Slater? I don't. Sounds familiar, though. He, he played at uh, San Diego State, and then he played at Chico. Okay. So Cody's there, and he's 5'3", 5'4", eighth grade. Jock's 5'3", 5'4", eighth grade. He says, hey, guys, I don't know if you realize this, but you all aren't going to be the same. You know, some of you guys are going to grow. You think you think Jock and Cody are going to be shrimps all their life? And, you know, Jock, stud, six foot two, 210. Now it's probably 225 and a good DH. Uh, and Cody ended up 6'4". Mm-hmm. You just don't know. Yep. But that, that was great perspective. And way back, I mean, that's why we don't count these 12, 13, 14-year-olds out. We don't know where they're going to be. For sure. Uh, when, when a guy's 13 and is 5'7 and a half, has a mustache, you probably think he's going to be 5'8". Mm-hmm. And so you, you you don't discount anybody. You keep going. Uh, good example. Uh, you remember uh, Mitch Cranson? Yeah. Cal. Yeah. So Bob actually, I, I just talked to Bob yesterday. He just got engaged, second second uh, uh, wife and everything. And I'm, I'm thrilled for him. He gave me one of the great lines, the De La Salle kid. Mm-hmm. And so uh, Bob always said to Mitchell, because Mitchell was upset. He was a, a sophomore at uh, De La Salle and he wasn't on the varsity. Mitchell was a great player. Mm-hmm. Uh, all his buddies on, on NorCal were all varsity. But it's Dale South. And they got a lot of guys. And so he says, Mitchell, do you want to be first first or do you want to be first last? He thought, hmm, Dad, I want to be first last. Mm-hmm. And so he kept working, kept working as a senior. Not only was he all league, but he was a player of the year in the EBAL. EBAL at that time, pretty special. Yes. Uh, and, and Mitchell played with five five or six future big leaguers on our NorCal team. So then he goes on and has a really nice little career at Cal, gets drafted ninth or 10th, has a great agent who's, who's a good buddy of mine, and he, you know gets some six figures, a uh, little bonus, played for three or four years, but now, now he's killing it in the business world. Absolutely. So those are the fun things, right? Totally. And, uh, the guys that we've had through uh, the relationships, that's the biggest thing. Uh, we won't talk about the wins and the losses. There's a there's a kid. I remember we were back in Virginia, and there was a, a great team, Richmond Braves. They're there. They're they're sitting on their bus. That's a rich area, Richmond, Virginia, and so just a deluge of rain. And we were always telling our kids, it's, it's not about the wins and the losses, everything else. And so we are up to our ankles because we're helping these guys on the field. We're taking mud out, throwing it into quick dry, and all that kind of stuff. And Brandon looks over and says, "Coach, is this what you mean by the journey?" So this is exactly what I mean by the journey. And those are the things that you always remember. Uh, 95, I'll give you one more story. Yeah. 95, uh, pretty good club. Uh, Jimmy, Mike Tonus, Xavier Nady, Matt Riley. Go Bears. A lot of oh, Bears yeah. there. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, we've had over 50. Yeah, I believe not, it. Not bad. Yeah. Uh, the funniest thing also is Exy, uh, he's got a glove on instead of swinging on that picture at, at, at the stadium there. It's like, come on. He swings it. That's yeah, what he exactly. Does. So we are, uh, we, we went out to, uh, talk about a great story. We went out to Iowa, played some unbelievable teams to Des Moines. Uh, one of the greatest highlights we ever had. Now, if you remember Jim Hill, Jason's dad, uh, Jim, Jim coached with me. Okay. Great friend. Uh, so we're back in 95 and we get to go up to Field of Dreams. It was only about one or two years old. We got to play on Field of Dreams. We practiced up there. I hit a ball into the corner with a wood bat. One of the greatest experiences. So we all brought baggies, all got some uh, spoons, got some dirt on there, put it in the baggies, put it in our back pockets for luck. 
And we, we were national champs. It's so cool. Yeah. Those are the things that you remember. Totally. That's fun. I think every time I sit down and talk baseball stories, there's not a whole lot of times we talk about the stuff that goes on the field. No. You know what I mean? I mean, the, the game is the avenue for us to have right. the relationships and, and the fun and same thing with the kids now, man. Like, yeah. I just, I, I, that's the thing. A lot of people keep talking about like, you know, okay, like you're going to do some like virtual remote. And I'm like, I just, I can't personally, it just doesn't fit me mm-hmm. because I'm about the relationships with right. the kids, you know, and, and getting closer to them. Right. My quick story. Yeah. We're playing. Um, so after my freshman year of high school, I go back, I'm playing for San Ramon Valley. Uh, I guess it's junior all-stars mm-hmm. at this time. And uh, we had a pretty good squad and not a whole lot of, this is kind of like we were talking about, this is kind of the limbo of where a lot of guys almost didn't really even know where to, to play right. sometimes because you're kind of in the middle of, are you playing like junior legion or are you going to go back play high school? There was like pony kind of in the middle. Right. And uh, so we go back and we're playing, we got a pretty good squad. We win district and uh, the next one is section. Mm-hmm. And we think we are hot shit. I mean, we think we're going, right? Yeah. And we go, we're playing at San Leandro Ballpark, and we're playing against Sunnyvale National mm-hmm. Little League. And uh, they have a little left-handed leadoff hitter that just goes whoop, into the bushes. First pitch of the game. We're like, huh. Guy comes out on the bump, throwing like, I mean, again, we're like 15, 16 years old, and he was 90-plus he was for sure. And we're like, whoa. And at the time, again, that wasn't seen a whole lot. It's not normal. Yeah. Um, that same guy, you know, probably hit eight doubles that day. Well, the, the left-handed hitter was Robert Perry. Robert, sure, play for me. <laughs> and Tulo. I think yeah, it was Tulo playing yeah. short, pitching and playing shortstop. Yeah. Oh, unbelievable. And we're, and we're like, literally, as bad as it sounds, because, you know, at the time you're a kid, you don't really know, but you're like, why are these guys here? Yeah. He's like, these guys are too good to even be here. But Robert Perry, I think, literally, I think he hit for the cycle that day. Robert missed like, a few weeks to go do that from our team. Did he? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. no, and, they were, and, they and were their, good. And their dad's coach. They're great people. They went to the World Series. They oh, yeah. finished like third in the country or something like Robert, that. Robert, at that point, was ahead of Troy. Okay. He was unbelievable. Uh, he, incredible. We player. couldn't, could not. There was no chance we were getting him he out that day. He could run. Oh, yeah. He could do everything. Yeah. And a great young guy, mm-hmm. just a great guy. I knew it. I knew it was Robert. Yeah, and then special. And then Tulo's on the bump. And yeah. I remember later we're like, it was that year. Long Beach was at Stanford for the regional mm-hmm. when he was a freshman. And we're like watching. It's like Troy Tulowitzki playing shortstop for. And I'm like, why does that name sound familiar? Yeah. You know, and I'm like, dang, that guy was good. Because as a right as a kid, we don't have that foresight we're, as to what is actually, actually really good. Like. Mm-hmm. You would have been at that game and been like, that guy's going to be a big leaguer. But yeah. me as a kid, I was like, oh, he sucks. Yeah. You know, you just have that kind of mentality. Yeah, you always think that. Oh, man, those guys were they Those were good. two guys are special. They're great people, too. For sure. And and that gets, you know, to, to kind of sum all this up. It's those relationships. Uh, it's, you know, the great thing about what we do, I think, is the relationships. And I, I don't think it's just our club. I think it's a lot of clubs. Uh, they are more like-minded than even in high school a lot of times. Uh, same goals, same drive. Uh, I've got guys who grew up in, 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 in East Oakland and in Danville, and they're best buddies for 20-plus years mm-hmm. because of baseball. Exactly. Uh, like-minded. Uh, it's, it doesn't matter. The, the, the whole thing is what, what brings them together, baseball camaraderie. I think the one of the things I'm sure that you'll miss is your, your, your buddies on a road trip. Uh, the, the locker room stuff, all those things. And, and I talk to big leaguers all the time, and they, they say, that's, I, I miss that part of the game, uh, being in the clubhouse. Uh, those are the things, you know, you get tired of, of, the, of the game sometimes. It kind of burns you out. But those relationships and uh, the, the relationships that have been forged from our program, I think Tony and I are more proud of that than anything else. So cool. Yeah. So cool. When I think about my teammates, right, I think about the relationship I have with them as friends and, and knowing that they do anything for me. More importantly is the network that you create. Mm-hmm. And I think it was interesting. I'd taken a golf trip with three of my former teammates from Cal. And I'm, you know, there's like a picture of us, you know, from one of the tee boxes. And I'm looking at it and I'm like, man, these are like three of my best friends. Yeah. But then I looked at it and I was like, one is my business partner, you know, one is my lawyer, and one is my real estate agent. Oh my gosh. And you and you just start to think, you're like, man, this is the network right. that is created because the reality becomes athletes are successful in the rest of their lives yes. because of all these lessons we talk about that gets you ahead. And so it also just creates such a network that's going to help you so much down the line mm-hmm. for sure. It's who you become exponentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's that 40 year decision who you meet mm-hmm. and it's incredible. Absolutely. It's the best. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Last piece is how oh, yeah. I end every pod. 
Somewhere when you go on the road, whether you go there a lot or not, we try to ask, I like to know the best places to eat in the area. So you got to name one place that sticks out to you to eat that so, you get on the road. I go to Phoenix a lot. I'm mm-hmm. down there 60 days a year. I bring a uh, minimum of 50 and sometimes 90 uh, people to, to this one place. So that obviously they like us. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's great. Uh, it, it, it builds that that camaraderie, everything else. And uh, we do, usually do an Arizona Fall Classic, then we do it at uh, USA Baseball. Bobby Q's. Bobby Q's. Bobby Q's in Phoenix. What, what kind of food? Uh, it's barbecue. Oh, nice. It's barbecue. Awesome. It's the original Bobby McGee's restaurant. I don't know if okay. you... That's a, maybe a little before your time. Yeah, sounds like it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was kind of a cool cool place for old people. Uh, but but Bobby Q's. And, and it's not in a great area. You don't want to walk around. It's like 27th and Dunlap, Rock the 17th. And I'm, we love it there. They, they treat us like kings. Uh, they do a great job for us. And literally, we've had... 50, 60, 70, it's usually 80, 90 people. Uh, and they take care of us great. So, we, cool. so everybody knows it. Uh, great little story. Uh, we had a, a family, uh, a, a guy, that, and he's a freshman, uh, Miguel and his dad, Matt Nixon. Uh, they're from Australia, uh, from I get from Ryan, uh, Rowan Smith. Oh, cool. And, yeah, it was great. And so he came over, and he had a wonderful time. He says, I'm going to be in Phoenix, mate. Where should I go? And I said, go to Bobby Q's. He says, oh, you were dead on. It was great, so and it's, cool. it's it's it was reasonable. Uh, the the service was great, and again those those pictures and the 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 video we take of everybody. I always take video. And then, hey, we're on our normal deal. Eighty people here, and we're all having a great time. So cool. Yeah. Well, hey man, I appreciate you taking the time coming here. Thank yes. you for all you do, and I, I want to say thank you again for a partnership. I think a lot of times in this youth world, there's not enough cohesion. And uh, I always love that we can bounce with each other oh. on guys that we have in common and, and help them get better. Well, that that's the whole key to this thing. It's it's the best interest of the player. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I appreciate you. Thank you. All right. All right. If you enjoyed that, be sure to like and subscribe. We'll have a new episode for you every single Tuesday here on our YouTube channel and wherever you listen to podcasts.